Bring the test back next time. Uh, we'll probably go over quite a bit of it. We want to get through as much of this as we can so that we have time next time to go over some of the stuff on the test. This chapter, chapter three, we deal with the basic concepts of probability, uh, conditional probability, multiplication rule, addition rule. We're going to talk about all this stuff uh, throughout the chapter. That's just an overview of the whole chapter. Main thing for this section is just the basic concepts of probability. Uh, in this section, I wouldn't write any of this down. This is just going over this section. Identify, so these are the things that we're going to cover today. Identify a sample space, which is just all of the possible outcomes of a certain situation. Identify simple events. An event is considered simple if there's only one thing that can occur, and we'll talk about that. Fundamental counting principle is not real difficult. Uh, fundamental counting principle gives us the total possible outcomes for any certain event. Distinguish between classical probability, empirical probability, subjective probability. There's three different types. We're going to talk about all three of those. Uh, determine the probability of the complement of an event. All that means is if I said I want the probability that I pick a male student in this classroom, then we could look at the female students as the complement. Right? It's like the two together always have to add up to the whole. Uh, be able to use a tree diagram and the fundamental county principle to find probabilities. Tree diagram is exactly what it sounds like. Looks like a tree, sort of. I'll show you how to do those. Sorry. Inferential statistics. Inferential statistics is, we talked at the start of the year about statistics and inferential statistics. Statistics is when you actually gather the data and you get all the data. Inferential is when you make inferences or you draw conclusions using the data. And I probably mentioned that uh, you do this in stuff like car insurance. When they make up your car insurance, whether you're a great driver or a terrible driver, your insurance right now is probably pretty high just for the simple fact that you're in that age group and they make inferences on you. So that's what a lot of probability is. A lot of probability is dealing with those inferential statistics, like what do we think is going to occur? What conclusions can we draw from the information that we know? Probability experiment, we're not going to do a, a whole lot of experiments, but the book will talk about them. It used to be in my younger days when I, my head didn't want to explode all the time when I was dealing, dealing with students like Lily over there. I, I, I would, see that's what I'm talking about. I would have students sit here and flip a coin a hundred times and we would do, actually do an experiment. Lily, I'm just messing with you. If you told me to flip a coin a hundred times, I would. I know, it, <laughs> but what I'm saying is what I've had happen in the past is when I give the coin to somebody and then they start flipping it and the coin ends up flying all over the room and after about 20, you get bored with it and you start doing this silly stuff with it and so on and so on. So we're not really going to do the experiment, uh, any kind of experimental probability, but all it is is you do some action uh, through which you get your results and we take measurements or responses, whatever, and we obtain all those results and we figure out stuff from that and then we can give inferences about stuff. Now, if it's something like flipping a coin, if I flip a coin 20 times and it comes up heads every time, does that mean it's going to come up heads the next time? No. 
Does that mean it's automatically going to come up tails the next time? No, uh, it doesn't, doesn't work that way. If you ever go to Las Vegas, out in Las Vegas, they have on the roulette wheel, right next to the roulette wheel, they have this big, like a big stick that's sticking up next to the roulette wheel. And it all it shows is it shows like one side red and the other side black. And okay, it came up red this time, it came up black that time, that time, that time, that time, that time. It came up red, then it came up black. And they put that up there because when somebody sees that, they say, oh my goodness, it's coming up red or black all these times. It's going, it's going to have to go on a run of coming up red every time. That's not the case, all right? And one, one event doesn't affect the next. Uh, an outcome, an outcome is just the result of one single thing, what, whatever you're doing. If you're flipping a coin, you flip the coin once, that's an outcome, whether it come up head or tails. Uh, but that's one simple or just one single trial. Sample space, sample space, sample space important, very important, so is outcome, but sample space, very important. It's the set of all possible outcomes for whatever event we're dealing with. So it could be if we're flipping a coin, the sample space would just be heads or tails. You'd have to make that list. And you might want to put that down. Whatever it's sample space, I know on the next test, it's going to say, what's the sample space for this? You're going to have to make a list of all the possible things that could happen. If we were doing the sample space of our classroom, then you'd have to just list everybody's name. That's the sample space set of all possible outcomes. And the event, event consists of one or more outcomes. So if I use you guys as my sample space and I say I want to find the probability of getting a male student, then those, uh, that's, that's our event. We want to get a male student. That's always a subset of your entire sample space. And you got you to make sure too that you understand that. It's always got to be a subset. That means it's always got to be part of it. You can't be flipping a coin and know that the sample space is heads or tails and decide that you want your event to be elephants because there is no elephant on the coin right so they, it can't it can't be outside of your sample space every event's got to come from the sample space it's got to be some subset of that sample space tree diagram. A tree diagram just looks like this. I wouldn't draw all that or anything, but if you're making a tree diagram, just maybe do something like, and, and we'll do another one here in a minute. Just know that that's what a tree diagram looks like. So, what do you think it looks like? Thank you, Michael. And Lily's wondering why I said she gets on my nerves. Well, I literally couldn't hear what you said. So, the first thing, what's it look like you're doing first here? Choosing a drink. Choosing a drink. That's your first choice. You got choice one. You're choosing a drink. And then your bread. Then you're choosing a type, type of bread, which there's only three of them. But type of bread, that's choice two. And then you're choosing the toppings. That's choice three. 
Notice with a tree diagram, what it, all it does, it does all this stuff and it branches off, says, okay, you could have picked the soda, you could have picked the bagel, and you could have picked putting cheese on it. So that's one possible choice, soda, bagel, cheese. This out here is your sample space. These are all the possible outcomes. So that's the sample space. And that's what you'll have to be able to list out on some of the different problems. Does it have to be in order? Like, like for example, can my, my different types of sodas go with like the um, cheese and roast beef is? And then can I? So could you do pick this first, then this, then that? Yeah. Yeah, you could change it up. And it should, but it should still come out to be this list now that you're, you know, you're instead of soda, bagel, cheese, it might say bagel, cheese, soda, but you're still going to come out with, if we look at this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, there's still always, if we're making those three choices, there's always going to be 24 outcomes. No matter how you set it up. Uh, probability experiment. Prob let's say if we're rolling a die, we want our outcome to be a three. The sample space, if we were going to list out the sample space for rolling that die, it's just the numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six. If our event, we decide what we're looking at for the event, we want the die to show an even number. Well, then the favorable outcomes, the things that we want to happen, two, four, or six. And then if we were actually finding the probability, with probability, and we're going to talk about this here in a minute, but with probability, it's always favorable. What you want to happen over what could happen? The total outcomes or the sample space. This would be like three, five, five, six. So it would be three over six. Uh, a probability experiment consists of tossing a coin and then rolling a six sided die. Describe the sample space. We're going to do this together. <coughs> so if we toss a coin, if we toss a penny, what could happen? Uh, if we're going to list the sample space, I'm going to make a tree diagram for it. This is how I would do it. You got a head, you got a tail. You could get one of those two. If I flip the coin and I get a head and then I roll the die, what could I get? Tree diagrams, you've seen how on that other one, it could be a lot. So a lot of times you probably don't want to make a tree diagram. If I flip a tail, what could I get on the dot? Now, to list our sample space, each one of these when I get them all listed, is our sample space. So for this first, I came up with a head and the number one. Then what? Then what? This whole list is our sample space. So how many possible outcomes are there in our uh, probability experiment? There's 12 possible outcomes. Again, we need that number because if we're doing a probability, that's always that total possible outcomes is always going to be the bottom number of our fraction. So 
this is the tree diagram. They listed the sample space out there. We did it together there. So, a simple event. Simple event is an event that consists of a single outcome. Just consists of one single outcome. So if I wanted to flip ahead and get a three, that's one outcome. There's, there's, even though you're doing two things, there's only one time where it could be a head and a three. Now if I did something like I said I wanted to get an even number with a head, then there's multiple outcomes. So that's not a simple event. So when it's only, if, if I go back, and I'll flip back to this one here in a second. But if I go back to this, a head and a three, there's only one of those. There's, it's not twice here, all right? If I changed it up and I said my event is I want to get, uh, I flip the coin and I want to get a tail and whatever number, well, then there's six different events that would work, or six different outcomes that would work. So that's not a simple event. An event, event that consists of one or more outcomes is not a simple event. So it'd be like tossing the heads and rolling an even number, H2, H4, H6. These are all events that we wouldn't mind if any of the three happened because that's what we want to happen, but it's, then it's not a simple event. It's no longer simple because now you've got more than one possible outcome. Identify if each event is simple, determine whether uh, you roll a six-sided die, event B is rolling at least a four. Would that be simple? Mm -hmm. What could you get? At least a four. Four, five, six. So that's not going to be simple because you're looking at three different things that could happen. Fundamental counting principle. Hopefully you don't need to see that up there. You can see principle down there. I'm not going to do that. Fundamental counting principle. Very, very important. Because you do not want to have to make a tree diagram or list out all these sample spaces all the time because they get to be too big. So the fundamental counting principle actually gives us a way a method that we can find all the possible outcomes by just doing a little bit of math. So if one event can occur in ways, the second event can occur in ways, and a third event can occur R ways. I'm not sure why my R there is not red like the rest of them. But the number of ways the events can occur in sequence, so if we were to make the tree diagram for it, it's just M times N times R. I know that it probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense there, but I'm going to show you some examples and 
It's not very difficult. And again, all this is doing every time, it's telling us that total. How many possible ways can this event occur? Telling us that bottom number of our fraction. can be extended, you don't really need to write this down, just know this, it can be extended for any number. It doesn't just have to be two or three or whatever, it can be 50 minutes. You're purchasing a car, uh, the possible manufacturers, uh, the possible manufacturers, car sizes and colors are listed. So manufacturers, how many choices do we have for manufacturers? How many for car sizes? And how many different colors? So all we're doing there, we're just going to take those. Instead of list them all out and making some big tree diagram where we go four GM and what's the quick working? Honda, and then saying, okay, from Ford we could pick compact, or we could pick uh, mid-size. And then for mid or for compact, we have four different colors and making all four branches off, off of it. And then finding that whole list to find the total of possible outcomes there, we can just take these numbers and do three times two times four. And you get 24. There's going to be 24 possible outcomes. Now the bad thing with using the fundamental counting principle. Do we know all the different outcomes? No. no. If we make the list, like the tree diagram, then we got a list there and we can look through that list and say, so if I go back, if I go all the way back here, if I go back to this and we say we want to get a head and a even number, then I can look right here and I say, okay, I got a head and a two, that's a favorable outcome. I got a head and a four, that's a favorable outcome. We can go through the list and see that we have three outcomes that we want out of the 12. But with the fundamental counting principle, you don't have that list, so that makes that more difficult, but it makes it a whole lot easier than listing all those things out. So there should be 24 ways, 24 different cars that we could pick. This is the tree diagram. Again, long drawn out. We probably, probably really don't want to have to do that every time to figure out that there's 24 possible outcomes. A pizza place offers uh, three kinds of crust. Twelve toppings and three kinds of cheeses. How many different one topping pizzas can they make? Do we really want to go through and list the three different kinds of crust to make a tree diagram off of that? It'd take forever. It'd take forever. Just take three times. So here it's three times, twelve times, three. Now you got to be careful here because I guarantee there's a couple of you are thinking, well, why you got twelve there? Because you're only taking one topic. Because those are our choices. All right? So we got, we're only going to take one topping, but we got 12 choices for that one topping. And what's that going to give you? 108. So that's all the different one topping pizzas that you could get. Now there's actually, there's more one topping pizzas than that there, but. We're not going to discuss why there would be more. Uh, you guys can probably figure it out. How about two toppings? What would we do then? Just double it, right? Just double that? You think that'd work? Because you're adding another topping. Or would you double one? Oh, okay. 
I don't, so let, let's think about it. How are we? Well, no, because once you use one topic, you're taking away one. It'd be three times six times two. Three times six? No. Three times eleven. Eleven. Because you took one away. Because you took one away. Because that's one of your options you've taken away. Oh, I think it's, oh, I see. Okay, now I understand the question. Maybe? Is that right? So it's just 3 times 11 times 3? Maybe. How many, how many choices are we making this time? You're only making one choice for the topping. We made one choice for the crust here, right? Yeah. Second choice for the topping, third choice for the cheese. How many choices are we making this time? We got the crust again. You have the topping, but two toppings. We got two toppings, so how many choices are we making? Two, four, four total. Four total. Three times twelve. So three. How many choices do we have for the first topping? Twelve. How many choices for the second topping? Eleven. Oh, okay. Oh darn. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So what if we wanted? What if we wanted three toppings? Okay, we have five right. choices. So you would, it would be three, twelve, eleven. So it'd be three times twelve times eleven times ten times three. Times three. And then the, the answer to the first one is one thousand one hundred eighty-eight. One thousand one hundred eighty-eight. So there's even almost twelve hundred different two topping pizzas that we can make. Probability. Classical probability is again three different types of probability. With this one, it's theoretical, you might write. This is the one that uses a math formula. Classical is just the what you would normally do if you're in a math class. At some point you dealt with probability in the past, and the teacher said, okay, what's the probability of rolling a two on a die? And you said there's one, two, so one out of six. That's classical probability. Each outcome in the sample space is equally likely. That All that means is that they all have the same chance of being, of occurring. For classical probability, this is the formula. And I'm going to rewrite it down here, just maybe so it makes a little more sense to you. Probability of whatever the event is equals favorable over total. When you're dealing with probabilities, they can be written as fractions, they can be written as decimals, they can be written as percents. Just depends on the what you're trying to do with it. Usually, I would just leave it as a fraction. Sometimes those fractions don't make any sense because the fraction might look something like this. Well, if I give you a fraction that says 572 out of 6,348, you're not going to have any idea whether there's a good probability that that event's going to occur or not, all right? Because those numbers are just too big and they don't make any sense. If we change that to a decimal or a percent, then it's going to make more sense to a normal person. So this book changes a lot of their stuff to decimals, and that's fine. A lot of times other books will change them into percents just to show you, hey, this is a percentage because that's what most people understand the best is some percent. If I say there's a 23% chance that this is going to happen, that makes more sense than something like these numbers here. So that's classical probability, classical. For classical probability, if we had a die, what's the probability of rolling a three? One out of six. And these fractions aren't too bad, so we might just leave it as a one out of six. 
because you can look at that and say, okay, one time I'm going to roll three, the other five times I'm not going to roll three. And that makes a little sense. What's the probability of rolling a seven? Zero out of six. Zero out of six. Uh, what's the probability of rolling a number less than five? Four out of six. And you could reduce it down to two out of three. It's not really a necessity to reduce it down. On your calculators, you got uh, the math button on your calculator. Math button. If you punch in something like four divided by six, and hit the MAC button, <clears throat> the first thing it says is fraction. You hit enter, and it'll reduce down any fraction for you. So if you want your answer as a fraction, just in reduced form, it'll reduce it for you. So if you get big numbers like I had written on the last one, then you could punch that in and see if it'll reduce on your calculator. Notice here, changed it to a decimal. Empirical probability. Empirical probability is something based on observations. So, Empirical probability is, is when you, you like take a survey or something and you look at the results and you see on that survey how frequently something comes out. The formula is basically the same thing except we're not looking at just a die and saying okay there's six possible outcomes. We're looking at our surveys and saying alright we surveyed 72 people, that goes on bottom, and 15 said yes. So it would be 15 out of 72. The frequency that it occurs out of the total number that was in our sample. So it's, kind of, it's based on some kind of ob observations or whatever, however you got the data. It's not just based on, hey, if we have this die, it's supposed to come up on a different number every six times, and it's going it's to you know, come up on something. Might be something for like, for basketball. Basketball's coming up. If you know you shoot 75% from the line, and you shoot four free throws, then you're expecting that you're going to make how many? Three. That would be empirical probability. A uh, company is conducting an online survey. I'm just going to go through this real quick. So 320 people have responded to the survey. So that's our total. What is the probability of the next person that responds to the survey says that traffic congestion is a serious problem. So all we're doing is look at this. We're taking that number right there. What is my pen not working again? Come on, you stupid thing. Gave out completely. We look at that right there. So our probability is just going to be 123 out of our total, which is 320. And again, you could take your calculator and reduce it down, or you could just divide it, change it to a decimal form. And we come up with about 0.38. Again, this number, though, to a lot of people doesn't make a lot of sense, so it might be better to change it to 3.84%. Law of large numbers. Law of large numbers just says as an experiment is repeated over and over again, 
The empirical probability of an event approaches the theoretical or the mathematical probability. So if we're flipping a coin, we expect that one half of the time we're going to get hits. Well, if we sit here and we flip a coin ten times, we might get eight heads and two tails if we do it ten times. What the law of large numbers says is if we keep doing this over and over and over again, even though this time we got where it looks like it's going to come up heads more than tails, if we keep doing it over and over and over again, we're going to get closer and closer and closer to that percentage that we think that it should come up, which is 50% of the time or half the time it comes up heads and half the time it comes up tails. So that's all the law of large numbers says. If we only do it 10 times, we could get some crazy results. But if we keep doing it more and more and more over and over and over again, then it's going to get closer and closer and closer to the theoretical or the mathematical probability. Subjective probability, the third probability. So you got theoretical, you got empirical, and you got subjective. Theoretical again is just all math. Empirical is from observations, what we see if we take a survey or whatever. Subjective is sort of like an educated guess. All right. So the two one uh, the two examples that are probably that you've seen is a doctor. A doctor makes a subjective or gives you a subjective probability when they say something like there's a 90% chance of full recovery. When you watch the weather, the weather person says there's a 40% chance of rain today. That's a subjective probability. And so those are based on, it's, it's I don't, educated guesses isn't a, a real good term but it's based on some education, something that they, uh, they're drawing from past experiences. That's a subjective probability. And again, another subjective probability is your car insurance. For students especially, the car insurance is a subjective probability. They've seen that people your age uh, are in more accidents than people who are 35 years old, so you're car insurance is higher. Classify the statement as an example of classical, empirical, or subjective. Uh, and remember, classical is theoretical. I call it theoretical. Usually I forget. The probability that you will be married by age 30 is 0 0.50. So would that, which one of the three would that be? It's going to be subjective. It's most likely something that we've just looked at different things and we're making a guess that about 50% of the people are married by age 30. So that's a subjective probability. Next one, the probability that a voter chosen at random will be uh, or will vote Republican is 0.45. Well this, we're getting this number because we've looked at people who have voted and apparently about 45 percent of them are Republican and the other 55 percent are some other uh, party. So that is <coughs> empirical. Empirical because it's based on our observations, based on what we've seen. The probability of, win, uh, of winning a 1,000 ticket raffle with one ticket is one out of 1,000. Well, that's just the, all mathematics. It's just you got one chance of winning out of a total of 1,000. So that's just classical probability or theoretical probability. Range uh, of probabilities rule. For probability, probability must always be, 
and this is written wrong, sorry. Probability is always from zero to one. Zero to one. It shouldn't say just between because it's got to include zero and one. Zero means there's no chance of the event occurring. One means that the event will occur always or every time. And anything else in the middle, like 0 0.3 or 0.82 or whatever, then those occur at whatever percentage it is. Anything, any event, so remember this says probability of some certain event. Anytime an event has a probability that's less than 0 0.05 or 5%, then that event is considered unusual. Let me erase this. So if you're looking at this number line, <coughs> remember zero says the event's impossible. 0.5 says that there's the same chance that the event will happen or it won't happen. One means that the event's going to happen every single time. Anything on this side means that the event's less likely to occur than it is, uh, or it's, it's more likely to not occur than it is to occur. Anything on this side means that the event is more likely to occur than, not, than to not occur. Whenever you're doing any set up all the probabilities of if we're looking at like rolling a die. So if we're rolling a die, you could, the possible things that could happen, the possible X's are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. If we find the probabilities of each of those things, all of these probabilities must add up to one whole. Or 100%. So all probabilities of, from a sample space got to add up to 100%. Complement of an event. The complement of, of an event is a set of all outcomes in a sample space that are not included in event E. And it's written this way. If we're looking at the probability of whatever that event is, the complement of that is written with this little thing on. So it's going to look like this. It's denoted E prime. It's got that little prime on it, that little asterisk on it, or not asterisk, that little apostrophe on it. The probability, this is the complement, this is the event, those two got to add up to one whole, 100%. So if we want the probability that we roll a two on a die, if that's the event that we're looking at, probability that you get a two, the complement of that is the probability that we don't get a two, or it would be a one, a three, a four, a five, and a six. And when we find these two probabilities, this is one out of six, this is five out of six, these two are always gonna add up to one whole. So if we're looking at this event, the complement is just everything else. What's the probability that everything else occurs? Or anything else occurs other than that original event. Another formula, probability of E equals one minus the probability of its complement. And then that formula could be written the other way also. The probability of the complement is just one minus the probability of the original the original event. You survey a sample of a thousand employees at a company and record the age of each, find the probability of randomly choosing an employee who is not 
between 25 and 34. And what we can do here, you see 20, between 25 and 34 is right here. Instead of doing all the math and adding up all of these others, which we could do, it's not that difficult, but instead of finding all those, to find the probability that they're not 25 to 34, we could just say, okay, we can find the probability that they are from 25 to 34 and subtract that from 1. So 1 minus the probability that they are between 25 and 34. So we do 1 minus the probability that they are between 25 and 34 is 366 out of our total, which is 1,000. And then you just grab your calculator and you do that math. And what we're doing is we're finding the complement. This is, if we're looking at this event, we're actually, what we want to find is the complement of that. And if I do all that math, it comes out something like this. this is, so the probability that they are between that age is that, and then we just subtract that from one, and we get this number. So about 63% of the people are not between 25 and 34. A probability experiment consists of tossing a coin and spinning the spinner shown. The spinner's got eight numbers on it there. Uh, every number on there is equally likely to occur. Use a tree diagram to find the probability of tossing a tail and spinning an odd number. So we're going to make a tree di diagram for this. We're going to do heads, tails. Again, we don't, I don't like making tree diagrams because it takes a bunch of work. There's, we could get a 1, we could get a 2, we could get a 3, we could get a 4, could get a 5, could get a 6, could get a 7, could get an 8. We got our tails, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then our sample space would be head 1, head 2, head 3, head 4, head 5, Head six, head seven, head eight. I'm going to start writing up here. Tail one, tail two, tail three, tail four, tail five, tail six, tail seven, tail eight. That's our sample space. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 16 total outcomes. And we said that we wanted, I got to go back a second. We said that we wanted the probability of tossing a tail and spinning an odd number. So we want a tail and an odd number. Well, if we look at this sample space, we can look at, we know that there's 16 total outcomes. We can look at the favorable outcomes. And I, what I like to do is go through the sample space, if I have it listed, and just circle the ones that are favorable. So a tail and a one is a favorable outcome. A tail and a three is favorable. Tail on a five is favorable. Tail on a seven is favorable. So there's four of them. So our probability would be four out of 16, and we could reduce that down to one out of four, or we could change it to a decimal and change it to 25%. Or 0 0.25. Your college identification number consists of eight digits. Each digit can be zero through nine, and each digit can, can be repeated. That's a big difference here in some problems. What is the probability of getting your college identification number when you randomly uh, gen generating, when randomly generating eight digits? So if somebody's trying to steal your ID, what's the chances that they're gonna randomly grab those eight digits? What I like to do on problems like this is I like to make blanks. If I know it's got eight digits, then I make eight blanks. There's four, five, six, seven, eight. For the first numbers, so possible outcomes for first numbers, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's actually ten numbers there. So for the first number, there's ten possible outcomes. 
since they can be repeated, the second number also has 10 possible outcomes. Third number has 10. Fourth number has 10. So on and so on. So all of them has 10. And using the fundamental counting principle, all we're going to do is multiply all those. That's going to give us our total possible outcomes. Now, once we find our total possible outcomes, they want the probability that uh, you randomly generate your number, your ID number. Well, there's a, you only have one ID number. So the probability is going to be one out of whatever this total comes up in. <coughs> so there's 10 choices for each of the eight digits. It means 10 times 10 times 10, eight times. That's 100 million possible identification numbers. And we want the probability that you get your ID number. Well, it's going to be one out of that 100 million. And we could change it to a decimal if you wanted. A lot of times you'll just leave it that way because um, that's not a bad number to deal with, really. If we're doing license plates, I can't remember how Ohio has their license plates right now. Um, but let's say on a license plate, and you guys might be able to tell me a little better, uh, on a license plate, maybe there's a number, then a number, then a letter, then another letter, then another letter, then a number and a number. I don't know if that's how it's set up or not. Maybe it's just two letters. So two numbers, two letters, two numbers. However it's set up. All, if there's six things, six faces on that license plate, then I'm going to draw six blanks here. We look at the first one. If it's a number, it's got to be zero through nine. So that's 10 possible outcomes. That number, 10 more outcomes, or 10 possible outcomes. Letter in our alphabet, there's 26 letters. So we're going to put 26 there. That one, you could repeat the same letter. So 26 chances for that one. Then 10 for this one, 10 for this one. To find the total possible outcomes, we just multiply all those. And that's all the different possible outcomes for license plates that there would be in the state of Ohio if this is the setup for, this, for our state, which I can't remember right now what it is. <coughs> the bad thing with this is a lot of times there are certain things that you can't use. And I, I don't remember what the restrictions are in the state of Ohio, but a lot of states don't use zero as one of their numbers. And they don't use one as one of their numbers. Just for the simple reason that zeros can look like O's in the letters and ones can look like L's. So they don't use those. Some states don't use them. So instead of having 10 possible things to go in that first spot, there might only be eight or it might be nine. And then other things might happen like some, uh, they might say that you can't repeat the same number over. So once you pick, if you've got this one, once you pick that first number, this possible might not be 10, it might only be nine. Same thing for letters. A lot of letters that they don't use on license plates because they're hard to see or they just don't, uh, like an I or something, they don't, you can't tell the difference between an I and a one. So, so the things might change through that. And again, if we were looking for probability, probability of getting your certain license plate, well, there's only one of your license plates, so it's going to be one out of whatever this total right here is once we get it finished. Odds. Two different ways odds could be set up. It could be odds of winning, odds of losing. Odds are different than probability. Odds compare successes to failures. So success to a failure. Odds of winning, when you're doing the odds of winning, the successes come first. When you're doing the odds of losing, the failures come first. So if I'm looking at, let's say, I want the probability that I roll a one on a die. Oops. 
So that probability is one out of six. The odds of rolling a one is one, because there's one favorable outcome, one success, and then there's five failures. So that's the odds. Odds of losing, if I wanted to roll a one out of six, that means five times I'm going to lose, and once I'm going to win. So that's odds. And if I give you the odds of something, if I tell you the odds of some event occurring is three to two, we can find the probability of that event occurring by saying if, if this is the odds of winning, so we're going to win this many times, we're going to lose that many times, we can find that probability by getting the total here, which is five, putting that on bottom, and then putting the wins on top. So the probability would be three out of five if the odds were three to two. <coughs> so be able to identify sample spaces. Make sure you can make that list. Identify simple events. Remember, that's just an event that there's only one uh, possible thing that could occur. Fundamental count of counting principle, that's where you're multiplying like 3 times 2 times 6 or whatever each, uh, when you have more than one thing occurring distinguish or tell between classical which is theoretical empirical or subjective probabilities determine the probability of the complement of an event, remember the complement and the event's got to always add up to one and be able to use a tree diagram and the fundamental counting principle to find probabilities like we were just doing there at the end. That's your assignment.